Act Out gets no millionaire or corporate funding. We are kept going by viewers like you and patrons like you. So to become a patron of our show and keep us acting out, visit patreon.com slash act out. This week on Act Out, we're in the midst of consumerism's high point. Fresh off the heels of Black Friday steals, sliding towards the most ironically plastic holiday of the year. Meanwhile, consumerist capitalism is tearing us apart, not only from each other, but indeed from ourselves. Depression and mental health issues are on the rise, and we're told to buy, buy, buy. Yet in the din of dollar signs and bottom lines, there are community efforts to connect on deeper levels, to highlight the sacred, the profound, and to work together to create, build, and resist. We sit down with the sanctuaries here in the Devil's Den to explore those ideas some more. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is Act Out. So we're all coming off the high, or the low, of a holiday, sliding willingly or with skid marks towards the behemoth of consumerist holy days, where the stark hypocrisy of celebrating a man who advocated against wealth and supposedly owned little to nothing is lost on most people who buy shit tons of useless and often unwanted knickknacks for people they pretend to like under the helpful facade of an eggnog-induced smile. Or something to that effect. Anyway, the truth of the matter is that regardless of how many Thanksgiving myths and Jesus is the reason for the season bumper stickers, our country is officially only concerned with one deity, the dollar. We are a capitalist consumerist nation and our value system is about as guided by love and kindness as Trump is guided by logic. It's to the point where even psychologists are remarking on how retail therapy is a good way of fulfilling the human need for social connection. Kit Yarrow, a professor of psychology and marketing, recently quoted a fellow therapist, Peggy Wynn, who said, We all enjoy a little retail therapy now and then. In small, manageable doses, it can soothe the soul. This is a hugely disturbing comment, not only because this woman actually thinks that a soul is something that can be appeased by whatever the hell is on sale at the Gap, but that people go to this woman for professional help, only to hear that their depression, their isolation, can be cured by a trip to the mall. Shopping does not soothe the soul. It momentarily fills a gaping chasm rendered by a capitalist isolationism that consistently overvalues stuff and devalues human beings. Shoving plastic into a deeply depressed soul will not make up for what we, as social and emotional beings, lack. Despite Yarrow and her so-called stylish friend's blend of psychology and marketing, psychological research indeed does not fall on the side of consumerism. The Association for Psychological Science published a piece stating that research shows that people who place a high value on wealth, status, and stuff are more depressed and anxious and less sociable than those who do not. In an article from last year, author George Monbiot wrote in The Guardian, Though our well-being is inextricably linked to the lives of others, everywhere we are told that we will prosper through competitive self-interest and extreme individualism. Consumerism fills the social void. But far from curing the disease of isolation, it intensifies social comparison to the point at which, having consumed all else, we start to prey upon ourselves. And if you look at the numbers, they reflect that thesis. Earlier this year, a new analysis from the CDC and Prevention's National Health Interview Survey shows that serious psychological distress, or SPD, defined as severe sadness and depressive symptoms that interfere with a person's physical well-being, is on the rise just as resources for mental health treatment are declining. To give you an idea, according to the research, 8.3 million Americans suffer from SPD today. Furthermore, if we broaden the lens to include mental illness as a whole, we find that one in five adults in America experience mental illness, with a full 43.8 million experiencing mental illness in a year, according to the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Also, one in five children aged 13 to 18 have or will have a serious mental illness. Depression is a leading cause of disability worldwide, and as suicide is the tenth leading cause of death in the U.S., 90% of those who commit suicide have an underlying mental health issue. 
Unfortunately, a full 60% of adults with a mental illness didn't receive any mental health services in the previous year. But at least there's retail therapy. Unless you're part of the 26% of homeless adults that are homeless and suffering from mental illness, which is really just the documented cases. So yeah, I guess if you're homeless, I, you're not probably frequenting the mall. Which is unfortunate because consumerism, though bad for our mental health, which is of course bad for us as people, is great for the profit beasts. Psychologist and author Oliver James wrote an article in The Guardian way back in 2008 about his book then on selfish capitalism, a research project over the previous 20 years that chronicled the effect of materialism in English-speaking nations, including the U.S. High levels of mental illness are essential to selfish capitalism because needy, miserable people make greedy consumers and can be more easily suckered into perfectionist, competitive workaholism. So if you're just shy of homeless, you can be a good prole that works your ass off to attain a measly amount of money to then attain that miserable bundle of plastic to momentarily make you feel valuable. Ironically, tying your self-worth to a worthless piece of product typically made by a horrendously devalued human for the sake of the stock option value of one or two humans. And there the cycle perpetuates. We feel empty, wrenched from real human connection, pushed and programmed into the paradigm of consumption, ever seeking the light as we dig through ever darker trenches of capitalism. How to break this chain, these chains, how to free ourselves from the confines of a plastic paradise and live for each other, with each other. There's not a singular answer to that, but some ideas. Some ideas came to mind earlier this month when I sat down with the co-directors of the sanctuaries here in DC. If you've watched this show in the past, you may have picked up on my feelings about personal evolution preceding social evolution. That we can't seek socio-political change before we ourselves evolve and continuously evolve and empower others to engage and evolve as well. Part of that personal paradigm resides in how we feel about ourselves and how we thereby feel about and interact with others. It resides in how we approach community building, community outreach, community inclusion, how we engage with voices different from our own, how we lift each other up, or if we do. Exploring mediums, letting the barriers of language fall before an art artistic expression built on shared experiences, made complex and powerful through multicultural and diverse perspectives. In this layered yet beautifully open space, the sanctuaries build, create, and indeed resist. Providing for real connections sans sail signs, exploring the sacred, the profound, human interaction, the foundation and the home base for imagining the world that we want and working towards it. So as you come off that high or the low, as you stare down the behemoth of consumerist holidays, consider these ideas, these paradigms, these community-run human endeavors as an alternative, a way to be thankful beyond the facade mythology of Thanksgiving and a, a way to stay connected far outside the flimsy and fleeting confines of a shopping bag. From the Devil's Den, the Sanctuaries. In 2013, there were about 15 to 20 of us um, who came together um, from all different parts of the city and all different backgrounds. And I think our yearning was for the experience of deep, real community. Um, that as we kind of moved through the city, there were lots of different people in lots of different spaces, but rarely in interacting and engaging in a deep way. At the very beginning, it was as much just the desire to do life together, to be together, um, to learn about each other, to share stories, and to support each other. Um, and it maybe makes a lot of sense oftentimes, I think artists um, at least in my experience, it can be a very kind of lonely and solo life. Um, and so it's probably not surprising that all of us were artists in one way or another yearning for that sense of community. So um, specifically, how do you go about doing that? Because, you know, sitting there at, at a restaurant on U Street and realizing, oh my mm -hmm. gosh, there seem like there are so many awesome people here. How do you bring them together? Mm. How do you bring them together? Mm. I think at the beginning it was very much about shared intention. Um, so, yeah, it, maybe there's a bit of a paradox that I've experienced over the years that um, the, clearer, the clearer we've been about who we are and what we're doing, the more invitational that feels to folks. 
Um, I think sometimes, at least when I was starting out, um, I was kind of the opinion, let's just kind of extend a, a broad net, everyone and anyone um, rock with us. And of course, we, we, we extend that invitation to everyone and anyone. But I think without that clarity of purpose, it's hard for people to feel like they have a place or to even have a kind of understanding of what the point of all this is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the vision is larger than any one person. So um, injustice at its roots is painful. Mm. And we are moving through an unjust world. And um, we have been moving through for centuries and generations and generations. It's just up, pulsing at the Mm. surface. And so in order to move through that um, with my sanity intact, I need people with me uh, who are also focused on that same calling to reckon with the injustice that I faced in the world and how I can use art and spirituality and my own social justice mindedness to approach that. So sanctuaries, uh, what we're calling it is multicultural organizing. Cultural organizing has been around since the beginning of time. It's Mm. just how we be with each other. We all have a different culture and a different uh, frame of understanding that we come to the table with. How can we use that to build a community in which we can all flourish Mm. and thrive? Mm. And so that's what the Sanctuaries is. It's a living, breathing example of how we can live and be together in a time such as now when it's painful to walk around and see these reflections that... um, are our shadowy sides really Mm. so you know sanctuaries is the answer to that calling Mm. so going in that direction of the multicultural organizing because this is a question that i feel a lot of artists and activists hear is well how did things change when trump was elected Mm. uh and but also understanding that trump is uh is a symptom of a larger system that Mm -hmm. is built on the things that he embodies Mm -hmm. so particularly as you know as you mentioned that you that we exist in this unjust world and Mm -hmm. it has been that way for quite some time Mm -hmm. how have you changed in the past year and how do you see that going forward Mm -hmm. particularly with that that um that focus on multicultural organizing Mm -hmm. Well, my understanding, like Raz said before, you have to have a clear vision. In order to enlist people in a vision, you have to be able to uh, really powerfully speak to that vision. So I believe that that's how we've changed. Like before, we were moving in a way where we were um, just honoring what was coming up naturally. Mm -hmm. And so now we've taken that honoring of what's coming up naturally and gotten focused, Mm -hmm. strategically focused. Because again, I can't enlist you in my vision if I can't accurately speak to it. And so the vision of sanctuaries is how do we be together with multicultural organizations organizing to uh, affect change. And multicultural organizing is how do I shift the culture of a space with arts and culture? So how do I shift policy? How do I shift environmental change? How do I shift racial inequalities? Like how do I create equitable spaces? Mm. I I will speak for myself in saying over the last year, it's become more and more clear to me how important it is for artists to be doing this work and um, how much of a gap exists um, in terms of tools, skills, knowledge between artists and kind of grassroots justice campaigns. And so as we look back in history and kind of lift up movements and campaigns that you know, we would point to as examples of successful or, or kind of meaningful expressions of organizing, of cultural organizing, Um, One of the pieces that, at least in my reading, is so clear is the importance of preparation and discipline. This isn't something you just kind of wake up one day and say, great, now I'm an activist or now I'm an organizer, right? Like maybe that spirit and that excitement, that sense of calling shows up, you know, waking up in the morning when, ah, now I can't not do this, right? Um, But to actually then do it is this long process of rigorous and vigilant preparation. And so I think in that respect, the emphasis that we have within our community, we actually, over the past couple of years, have been developing a training program um, and offering a training program for artists um, to, to build these skills and to get practice together, learn together how to put their artistry in service of social impact. That work, I think, feels particularly timely right now as more and more people are saying, I'm ready, activate me. I, I want to do this work. Um, I feel like, yeah, the importance of, of really making sure that we have those processes and those programs to help empower folks and, and you know, prepare folks for this work is, is that much more important right now. 
And I want to get back to the specifically the arts and activism connection, but yeah. first I want to because the 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 word spirituality and hmm. sacred means so many different things to so many different people, um, particularly in a country like this that is poisoned a lot by right wing hmm. uh, supposed Christian extremism. Hmm. Um, so in that sense, you know, like hypothetically, like an atheist walks in here, mm-hmm. um, and a Muslim walks in here. Mm-hmm. Is there? This is starting to sound like a bad joke, but um, is there? Is there any sort of um, like structure around what spirituality and the sacred means? Is that mm. something that people need to recognize as they walk in? Mm. Talk a little bit more about that. Yes, yeah, values based on how we be with one another. So we have our own honor code and our own value system of how we be with each other, whether you show up as an atheist or a Muslim or a practicing Christian or devout in your faith in any other form. It's how I choose to be with you and um, respect that you matter and that I matter. And so understanding that I matter, I can look at you and say that you matter as well. And understanding that um, there's a culture of politeness that's present in the world. Mm. And so if you're going to build an intentionally multicultural space, you have to understand that we need to address that culture of politeness head on. So that means that if someone is speaking um, based on... uh, Uh, understanding that I'm going to say this just to say it so it won't hurt your feelings, Mm -hmm. then uh, we want to reshape that into it's not about hurting a feeling. Sometimes feelings get hurt in authentic relationships, but it's about how do I respect you but also honor the perspective that Mm -hmm. I bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And so that's what the sacred and the spiritual is in this community, in my experience, Mm -hmm. is me bringing to the table that I am a sacred being and that I matter and how can I be with someone else and also uplift that they matter too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautifully said. I mean, I think my... You know, it's interesting because I come, you know, kind of having been, I guess, trained or prepared um, at the graduate level um, for leading spiritual community, for being in spiritual community. Um, And as grateful as I am for that preparation, I feel it's I, I worked as a chaplain for a bit at a hospital and, you know, being able to really companion people in a deep way, um, I think is one of the, in my experience, one of the most beautiful expressions of the spiritual life. I'm just being fully present, right? Uh, Simone Bay talked about prayer in terms of full attention. How do we fully give our attention um, to someone or to something um, and that sense of companionship? At the same time, there are many things I've had to unlearn um, through this work in terms of the rigidness and the narrowness with which kind of religion, faith, spirituality is so often defined. And I think the living, breathing expression of it that I found is very similar to what Omni was describing. Um, All of us, in my experience, carry a sense of ultimate authority. Um, There's something or some things, oftentimes there are many voices that carry that sense of authority, that carry that sense of ultimacy in our lives. So, you know, here's an invitation to get clear on what those are and to determine, are these serving us? (laughs) Um, You know, are these continuing to to guide us in the directions we want to be guided or do we need to renegotiate and reevaluate that, right? Um, that sense of ultimate purpose, that sense of, you know, what is my life ultimately about? Um, Those are big questions that, you know, we can sit around and, and, you know, ponder and talk about, but I think they're oftentimes lived questions and they're gonna inform what we prioritize in our life, how we show up in spaces, what we dedicate our resources, our time, our energy to. So, you know, spirituality, I don't think has to be something kind of nebulous and Mm -hmm. out there. That's not to say that there there aren't those experiences. I'll speak for, like, I've had them in my life of, of something that is greater than. Um, and I've struggled a lot in my life with my health. And there have been some moments of profound and ultimate suffering and struggle um, where I have experienced in a very intimate way um, a sense of deeper peace, a sense of the ultimate, of the eternal, whatever we might name it. I choose to name it God because that is the tradition, speaking to multicultural organizing, that's one of the cultural traditions that I grew up with. So that word carries a lot of meaning for me. Um, but, you know, God is not God's name. That, that is a name and you know, many names that we choose to point to something which is ultimately greater than anything we can fully give language to. So there are those moments that I've had in my life of experiencing the transcendent 
I want a space that honors that experience, that doesn't put me in a position where I feel like I have to defend it constantly or where I feel like I have to, you know, push it down anyone else's throat. I mean, these are, these are my experiences and they have profoundly shaped who I am and how I navigate this world. So a space that welcomes that and invites me to engage and to really deeply connect with and build with and work alongside and make art with people who may or may not have had that experience. To me, that is the fullest expression of, again, in my language, the kingdom of God or, or the beloved community or, or that ultimate kind of goal towards which the faith traditions that I grew up with are, are speaking to. Um, and so being able to both make space to experience the unexpected um, presence and movements of the great sneaky one, as I like to refer to, <laughs> Um, you know, that, that's a beaut I mean, to me, that is, that is the fullness of life. Um, so I, 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 I have to make space and I have to be disciplined. It's a practice. It's choosing time and time again to be aligned with that way of moving through the world as opposed to the many other ways that I'm constantly being told that I should move through the world. One of competition, one of antagonism, one of scarcity, um, one of white supremacy. I mean, th these are the narratives and, and, and the stories that I'm constantly consuming. And so it's hard work to choose um, a sor source of ultimacy and authority that is different than that. I need people to help me do that. And so having a, a, a community that is inviting me to reconnect to those deeper sources of authority and purpose, I, I know I wouldn't be able to do this work without it. And I, I'll just say, I mean, that's one of the other things I think that has been so beautiful and powerful for me to witness over these years is the way in which in working with so many different organizers and activists and campaigns, the, the role of the spirit um, is so integral to this work. How do we develop practices of resilience? How do we develop practices that allow us to engage trauma and to engage conflict in a productive way? How do we show up in spaces that are incredibly tense and toxic in a way that's centered and grounded? Again, in my language, these are deeply spiritual questions. Maybe you want to refer to them as, you know, ethical or, or, and that's fine. I mean, really, let's not let the language get in the way of these practices that make this work possible in the first place. And so I don't really see the spiritual as being, or, or I, again, whatever language we want to put to it, I don't see that as being an option. I see that being as being integral to this work. And I have a hard time, at least for myself, imagining being able to do this work in a productive, meaningful, collaborative, mutually empowering, equitable way without those practices, without those frameworks, without that community of people who will honor me in the fullness of who I am as a sacred person. So um, with that, let's also talk because there's a lot of different messaging yes. uh, that that comes out of this space yes. and so many different minds and backgrounds mm -hmm. yes. and ideas that mm -hmm. come fr that are producing this sort of art. So how do you uh, how do you come together with all those different people to create one cohesive message mm -hmm. or a set of cohesive messages? Mm -hmm. Because, of course, art is about communication. Mm -hmm. yes. And if you're coming from so many different backgrounds, do you find that it's difficult to mm -hmm. then create a one simple message that a lot of different people from different backgrounds can also digest and mm. talk a little bit about the, the, the process of then creating this art. Mm. Mm. Yes, it is a challenge and it's a necessary challenge. And that's the beauty of artistry. How do I face challenges in an mm. innovative way? And so this is how we've chosen to face challenges in an innovative way. And um, I think at the core of our community is like the quote from um, Bertolt Burt, Brecht. Is Brecht is that uh, you know I am not an artist to hold up the mirror you know that's not my purpose as an artist to hold up a mirror to the world I am to be a hammer shaping it and so we are a hammer constantly shaping that and so we run into different challenges along the way whether it be language whether it be how we communicate something whether it be um, uh, understanding or our perspective or just racial biases or any other kind of bias that's present. So the opportunity there is to um, address those uncomfortable spaces instead of run from it. Mm -hmm. It'll be easy for me to hide from it. Uh, but art can support me in being a hammer at shaping. Okay, I'm coming up at my own personal bias of how I see you and how I view you. So I have the opportunity to face that using my art or run away 
And uh, sometimes it, I can run away and come back. There's mm-hmm. just so many multiple truths that exist. So uh, yes, the process is to be that hammer shaping the world that we want to be using our art and how we sit in those sacred spaces or how we need to take a reprieve from that space and mm-hmm. come back. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the number one crux of the community, the foundation is that I come back mm. and that I serve myself at the highest level so then I can then be in companionship with these others these other artists in a valuable way. Hmm. Talk about how the, like talk about the importance of art yes. in organizing. I mean, you mentioned yes. training earlier, but also yes. just in terms of the, of the visuals and the power of a, of a spoken word piece or music. Talk a little bit about that hmm. connection since it's so integral to your work. Mm. Yeah. I love that question. Um, well, there are a couple things that are coming up to me. Um, one is a very simple statement that one of the artists, um, Aaron Johnson Bevel, uh, made a number of years ago that's really stuck with me. She herself um, was trained as a lawyer. And she said, look, I uh, was trained as a lawyer and practice law because I believe that law can change people's minds. I'm also a singer because I believe that the arts can change people's hearts. and she offered that again not as you know choose one one's better than the other we have to invest all our time and research no there was a kind of honoring of the ways in which these things work together so i think there's one voice in my head that's saying the power of the arts is the power to stir people to action the power to give people experiential knowledge of something or experiential awareness of something that otherwise might reside only up here and i think we Uh, kind of all know that um, as powerful as whatever lives up here can be, um, there's something about being moved, right? That that word in and of itself is significant. We say, I, you know, I was moved by that piece of art. And implied with that is then the movement to take action, the movement to do something about it. And the arts have an incredible power to do that. To learn more about The Sanctuary's work, visit thesanctuaries.org. And that will do it for this week's Dose of Dissent. Thank you so much for watching. Please spread and share this with all of your friends, foes, and people you don't know. Check out the last slide and the show description on YouTube to see the sites that we mentioned in this week's show. And for interim updates, please do visit us on social media. From the Devil's Den and the home of The Sanctuaries, good night and act out. And real quick, to keep independent, non-corporatized media like this show going, donate at Occupy.com slash donate. If you'd like to donate directly to Act Out, visit Patreon.com slash Act Out. I can't hear the boots are stopping. Come on, boys, let's get some rest to throw. Can't stand to hear my father cry anymore. Time, time, we left one of you motherfuckers dead in the road. We've been begging up his eyes. We got nowhere else to go. It's been too many years since your pussy sucked my shove. I'm not a violent man, but I.